Welcome to our epic ocean, where critical solutions to a planet in peril are brought to the surface. Our epic ocean celebrates all that is epic about the ocean and why it is the planet's most vital resource. And now to our host, Rich Gurman. In 1993, the movie Free Willy was released. The film tells the story of a foster child, Jesse, who befriends a captive orca and then ultimately releases the whale back into the wild. The story is based on a real orca, Keiko. Millions of people all around the world fell in love with this movie. The film grossed over $150 million and turned into a small franchise. Children everywhere cheered and cried tears of joy at the end as Willie jumps the breakwater and lands in the open ocean, finally free to return to his family. But there's a problem. The Hollywood ending was fabricated. The story was a lie. My guest today, along with his partner Jean-Michel Cousteau, played a major role in turning this lie into a real-world happy ending. As the executive director of the Whale Sanctuary Project, Charles Vinnick is no stranger to ambitious, forward-thinking, ocean-related projects. For over 25 years, he's worked closely with Jean-Michel and his late father, the legendary ocean explorer Jacques Cousteau. He co-founded the Cousteau Research Centers, played a major role in the growth of the Cousteau Society, and for a decade served as the executive VP of the Jean-Michel Cousteau Institute, an ocean future society. Charles, it's an honor and a pleasure to welcome you to the show. How are you, man? Thanks very much, Rich. I really appreciate it, and thank you for that uh, very kind uh, welcome. Oh, I'm glad that you are here. And uh, let's start with the real story of Keiko and his incredible voyage from Mexico City to Oregon and then ultimately back home to Iceland. Can you take us on that journey which led to the creation of the film Keiko, Born to be Wild? Well, thanks, Rich. You know, it's, it's really interesting and it's, it's nice of you to attribute any of that story to me. But really, it's the tens of thousands of children who saw the movie Free Willy heard and understood that there was a real whale, and they wrote to Warner Brothers. They wrote letters and cards, some of which I have, uh, to the Humane Society of the U.S., and basically the kids demanded that something be done. And so it's thanks to them that the Free Willy Keiko Foundation was created, and uh, a number of people, the Humane Society of the U.S., Craig McCaw, uh, and others, Earth Island Institute, came together and created the opportunity first to rehabilitate Keiko at the Oregon Coast Aquarium in a tank specially built for him with natural seawater. And then uh, myself and Jean-Michel were invited to join the board of the Free Willy Keiko Foundation. And we were part of the team that moved the whale first to a habitat in Iceland, and then took him out into the open ocean and took him on what were the first open ocean walks. Take a whale for a walk. Who would have thought it? <laughs> and uh, we could talk more about that, but created the four-year project to try to reintroduce Free Willy, reintroduce Keiko to the wild. Beautiful. So why was documenting this and bringing this story to light so important? Well, I think for all of those children who said, you know, the story was beautiful, but it wasn't true. It was really important to try to create that same story and make it true. And it hadn't been done before. No other whale uh, had ever really, from captivity, had the opportunity to go back to its native waters and see whether it could rejoin its family. And what made that so difficult, not so much releasing a whale, but orcas live in a family unit their whole lives. The males leave their family unit to, to mate, but they come back and live with their mothers, their sisters, their aunts, and their, their cousins and uncles and brothers and sisters. And that's what the challenge is. Can you find their family? Do they recognize one another? Can they bond with another family? All of those things were unknown. Mm. And that's what that research project for four years in Iceland was all about. And, you know, in, in short, what we learned was that we've always known 
how easy it is to capture a whale. What we learned is how difficult it is to put one back. And it's partly all of that story and all of that experience that informs everything we do today with the Whale Sanctuary Project. Beautiful. And we're definitely going to talk about that in detail. So not only is it finding the whale or the whale's family, but this is a story both about the plight of Keiko and also his untraining, right? And not only what the the whale had to be untrained from after using that, all the, all the people involved had to learn also, right? I think kind of to your point, a lot of people probably think you can just drop a whale or dolphin back into the ocean after years in captivity, but it it's definitely not that simple. So can you help us understand that part of it better? Yeah, I think I think a lot of people, even research scientists at the time, and we're talking you know, 1998, 2002, 2003. So we're talking 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago when, when this first began. And many people, research scientists and the like, thought that if Keiko was back in his own environment, the environment in which he was born and he'd been captured in at the age of two years old, that he would just, his instincts would kick in, he would swim off, find a pod, they would welcome him and the like. But in fact, the social structures of these animals are much more complex than that. The pods have individual dialects. So he may well be speaking a dialect when he gives sounds that isn't recognized by wild whales that he's adjacent to. So we took him out into the open ocean. We had to learn how to do that. How do you take a whale for a walk? You you know, you don't leash, you don't put him on a leash and just drag him out somewhere and hope he goes. So the team, as you've said, had to learn techniques, had to use techniques for training that are known in the captive industry. You initiate training and reinforcement with fish and the like to reward him when he goes out. But also, we're talking about whales that travel a 100 miles or more a day. So in a sense, He's used to swimming in a tank initially, then in a bay. And so we take him out and we go 10, 15, 20 miles, training not unlike you or I might train for a marathon, mm. building our stamina, getting stronger. And the beauty of doing that was to see how Keiko responded to his environment, how he just grew in stature. You saw his, he got bigger, he got stronger, he got heavier, he got longer because he was doing physical training. And then he had to get used to being on his own and not necessarily thinking of his trainers and his human group as his human pod mm -hmm. and be comfortable in experimenting in the ocean and going out. And we would see that he got more and more confident in that environment, got comfortable approaching wild whales. They were scary. Who were these critters? <laughs> got comfortable with that environment. And over time, he got more and more engaged in the natural marine environment. Incredible. You mentioned that you and Jean-Michel worked with that team for over four years. Uh, how did Keiko's health transform in that period? I, I think he gained a couple thousand pounds. You mentioned that he grew. Tell me more about that health transformation. Some of, some of that health transformation took place at the Ogre and Coast Aquarium. He was there for two years. He was moved mm -hmm. from really a very... A uh, difficult, harsh environment in Mexico City. Think of that, living, you know, at more than a mile above sea level in a hot, artificially saltwater environment, very small, going in circles. Basically, at the time the film was made, he had a papilloma virus. He had all kinds of rashes on his skin. Got to Oregon, cold environment, natural seawater, much bigger, much deeper with a team dedicated to getting him healthy. And they spent two years doing that. A team of veterinarians uh, decided, uh, inspected his health and looked at all the records and determined that he had uh, the health and the capacity to be moved back to his natal waters. And then he was flown in a C-17, the largest transport plane at the time. We air to air refueled twice en route and I was privileged to be part of uh, that transport team, go to Iceland. And there we had animal care staff. The team had lived with him in, in uh, Oregon for those two years. And they really are the, the heart of the story. Sure, I got to manage it, but these are the skilled 
mm. people who understood the training, understood all the health requirements, were with him day and night, dedicated to figuring out how to take him out into the open ocean. And we only had the summer months from late May to late August when the wild whales were there. Harsh weather conditions. Whenever we could go out, we would. But during the winter months, we were in the bay. Mm. And we would have 100, 120 knot winds. All of our infrastructure would be stressed and the like. And so just being able to live in that environment during the winter months in order to have the summer to go out into the environment and see if he would bond with whales. And every year, at the end of the summer, as he was experimenting with interacting with wild whales, then they'd be gone. We'd go back to the bay for the winter. The next May, he would pick up exactly where he left off, not regressing at all in terms of fear or reticence or anything like that, but going right back to being where he was the year before. And it's that sense of knowing his environment that convinced us we should re keep going every summer. That's beautiful. You, you mentioned the flight to Iceland. I, I think I heard Jean-Michel describe that as a miracle. Um, can you describe the emotion that you and the team felt? I mean, obviously, over the years, you created this deep connection with this whale, what was the emotion that you felt as this transport happened? Well, I mean, <clears throat> the transport was a remarkable engineering feat in itself. I mean, you really have the, the, the only time the U.S. Air Force has leased a plane to a private group for, uh, for something like this. And it was deemed in the national interest that we should do this. Uh, and then you air to air refuel twice. So you take off very light because it's a short runway. Air to air refuel, the moment you get in the air to get enough fuel to get to the other end of the U.S., then you take on only as much fuel so you'll be light landing on a small island off the south coast of Iceland. And then when we get there and you've got UPS to take the transport box off the plane and down to the bay and Keiko goes up from a crane in a sling into the water and you see him shake, shake it off, get out of the sling and swim around. And you see Jeff Foster, his lead caregiver in the water with him and Jeff's emotion because he's, he's there with the whale and the other team members are in the water and you feel and see how elated they are and how emotional they are for the first time when he's in the bay and in natural waters. Uh, so, yeah, I was a part of the team and I got to share that. But the credit goes to the caregivers, to the team, the trainers, the vets, all the people who were really doing the whale work that I over time learned to do. But it wasn't the skill set I came with. That was their skills. You're, you're so humble. And I, I have chills listening to the story. I could only imagine how you felt in that moment and the joy you felt for Jeff and the other people that were there. So in the end, I mean, this story is really about transitioning a captive animal back into the wild. Would you say that you were able to turn the lie of Free Willy, the movie, into a truly happy ending, a success story for the world to see? Well, I think it's, it's a transition, certainly for Keiko, for the whale. It's also a transition for the people, for all of us who were working with him, because he taught us about what it's like to go from being a captive whale to being a semi-wild whale. And so, you know, he did experience meeting other whales. He experienced going with them. And in 2002, in the summer of 2002, he was with wild whales from the first day we took him out. He left us of his own accord, and it was always left to him. We would turn off the engines because the engines and the cavitation of the engine was a little like a whistle. He knew us, mm -hmm. and so he'd swim off. And our protocol was, if he swims away, we don't turn on the engines. It's up to him. If he comes back, he comes back to us. If he doesn't, he's free to go. And from that first day in the summer of 2002, there were a lot of wild whales. There was a big, huge herring ball around, and they were all feeding on it. He stayed with them for three to four weeks, swimming around the island, not coming back, obviously feeding with them. He wasn't quite 
in the pods, in this super pod of whales. We had a sailboat out there, no engine, sailboat observing, mm -hmm. cameras. And he would stay 20, 25 meters away. And then in a big storm in, uh, in August of that, of that summer, we took the boats in and we heard him. He had a radio tag and a satellite tag on, and we could tell where he was generally by the radio signal. And he left the island and he swam a thousand miles to Norway on his own. He left with wild whales. Every day we would get a signal from the satellite tag at about eight in the morning. And we could tell where he was at eight in the morning, but not where he was at nine, 10 or 11 or as the day went on. So we took a plane out to follow him and we could hear him a little bit when we got close. Uh, we never saw him. We then went to the Faroe Islands and we got a helicopter there and we could tell where he'd been and we could again hear him, but huge waves, we couldn't see him. And we knew he was headed to Norway. And we sent a team of people to where we thought he would be. But, you know, he was free willy. He had a bent dorsal fin. Everybody knew him. The news was out that he's coming. And he found a fishing boat. They threw him some fish and he followed him home up a fjord. And he lived for the next year and a half in that fjord with caregivers there providing food. He could come and go as he want, no enclosure. And then in the winter, in December of 2003, he contacted, contracted a respiratory ailment, and he died. And he was the oldest male whale in captivity at the time, uh, about 27, 28 years old. And so what is the story? What is the conclusion? Is it a success? So I would say this. I think it was success, a success in every sense of the quality of life that he was able to receive for all of those years in Iceland and in Norway, in which he could come and go as a whale at his free will. He lived a very enriching life. He had tremendous health. And as you say, he gained weight. He gained robustness. The pictures behind me where you see him coming up on my shoulder, jumping in the open ocean. That was a very vibrant life. So in that sense, it was a complete success, quality of life. But were we successful in helping him bond with a pod of wild whales and swim off and live the rest of his life in a whale family? The answer to that's no, we were not successful in helping him do that. So it's a mixed story. And that's what informs us today to say that for wild orcas and belugas that have been captured or that have been born in captivity and lived their lives in captive parks, can they be released? And I think the answer is probably not. They don't have the skills. And there are very few circumstances where you could put together a team for four or five years and the cost of doing that and try to return them to the wild. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's realistic. And therefore, I think we need to create sanctuaries for them where they can have 100, 150 times the size and space that they have in a marine park, in a concrete tank, but where they have care and where they can live with their brethren and sisters uh, in a much different but natural seaside environment. I think that's a more realistic approach. I agree. It sure sounds like it. It's it's hard not to get emotional just hearing you describe the whole thing. I mean, Keiko's story, it's an epic one. Yet sadly, as you know, there's over 3,000 whales and dolphins that remain in captivity around the world. And we hold them prisoner, right, for our entertainment, for our profit, and often for research. Fortunately, we have people like you who have committed their lives to protecting these animals. The research part, I can understand, but all else just seems like a big fail by the human species, huh? Well, you know, these animals in marine parks, whales, orcas, dolphins, belugas, what have you, they have raised millions of dollars for the people who care for them. They've entertained tens of millions of people. We owe them a retirement in quality of life. We try to do this for humans. 
We try to provide retirement communities for them. Now is the time to do that for whales that have lived in captivity, that have entertained us, that have helped people make profit. Let's give them a, a, a pension and let's have them live in sanctuary. Amen to that. So anyone that knows my story uh, knows that it was a video that I shot of a chance encounter with a pod of four orcas on my paddleboard here in Laguna Beach that led to massive exposure, most importantly, by many top ocean organizations. And that led me to create my Blue Laguna book, uh, also to start a nonprofit and this podcast, essentially committing the majority of my efforts towards working to protect the ocean and the sacred life that calls it home. In fact, and I, and I hope that, you know, if I can just interrupt for a moment, <laughs> that if any of any of the people who are listening to us today haven't had the opportunity to go on your website, and oh. to see your pictures, to see your book, and to purchase your book. I've had the privilege in the, in the last few days since we've met to see your book, to learn more about your story. And it's, it's truly very, very special. And I hope all the people who are listening will tune in, will purchase the book, and will get a chance to experience vicariously <laughs> some of what you've experienced oh. in the wild. You're kind, Charles. And, and just, I appreciate that. And just so anyone knows, if you do buy the book, all, I don't make any money on the book. All the money goes right <laughs> to, to the nonprofit. In fact, that the pod of four orcas was the CA51 pod, which now has five members. There was a new baby that was born just hey. in February of this year. So, um, the incredible work that you, Jean Michel, and the whole team did with Keiko led to the creation of the Whale Sanctuary Project. Uh, so can you share what this is, how it came about, how long this idea has been in the works? Give us the details on that, please. Sure. There, you know, starting in, in 2000, really 15, a number of people that there is a, a, a meeting every couple of years, a gathering of, of whale uh, lovers, if you will, people who love whales and get chance out on, uh, on San Juan Island where they come together. And out of that, a number of researchers led by Dr. Lori Marino, who is a neuroscientist who studied the brains of whales and the culture of whales for many years. She has really been the founder of the Whale Sanctuary Project. A number of us were invited to join the board of directors, myself as one, others from other organizations. And uh, under Lori's leadership, we've created the Whale Sanctuary Project a team of people dedicated to creating uh, a natural seaside sanctuary where whales who are in captivity can live in an environment that's as close to their natural habitat as they would find in the open ocean. Jean-Michel Cousteau, Sylvia Earle, and many others have joined our board of advisors. And so I'm uh, privileged to be the executive director, to also serve on the board with Lori and others. And uh, we spent the first two years, 2017, 2018, and early 2019, looking for the ideal site. We looked at over 130 sites in British Columbia, in Washington State, and in Nova Scotia, Canada, looking for a physical environment with the right depth, the amount of space, 100 acres or so, that we could net off for whales, good flow, good tidal flow and current so that it, the area would be flushed all the time and would be a natural and sustainable environment for the whales. But equally important, finding a community of people that embraces the vision and wants a sanctuary in their community, because you have to be realistic. Coastal area today, everyone wants the coast. They want to put a dock. They want a place for their they're both. They want an area where they can go paddle boarding or whatever. And we're talking about netting it off and restricting it so that people can't do that. We want mm -hmm. it for the whales. So you have to find a special community as well that embraces this idea just the way we do. And in the community of Port Hilford, Wine Harbor, Sherbrooke, we have found a community of people that are just as committed to this as we are. And they are our partners in doing this in every way. Nice. And that's Nova Scotia, correct? That's Nova Scotia on the eastern shore of Nova Scotia. Pretty remote spot. Uh, not easy to get to, which is a good thing. Uh, about three hours from the capital of, uh, of Nova Scotia, Halifax. 
And so uh, this is where we will be. We're in the process right now, as we speak today, of opening a visitor and uh, operations center. Even got a couple of bedrooms in this building where when I go, I don't have to stay in a hotel or and I can be there. Uh, but that's the first step. We have uh, gone through the lease application to lease uh, the submerged land from the government. It's called Crown Land. Uh, so we're in the lease application process. We're getting all our permits. We've done uh, really a year and a half of environmental research, making sure that nothing we do will negatively impact the environment and that the environment is suitable for the whales that we'll bring. So we're, we're on our way. We're doing this. I've been a little, uh, you know, certainly the travel restrictions with COVID and the like have uh, made it a little more difficult this last year, but it's all going very, very well. I have a question I didn't think of until now. So you'll, you would net off an area, put these captive whales in there, and that would be their home. What about other animals that would typically be in that area? Could they come and go through the net? Um, how I'm sure you've thought of all these things. Good question. So the net area, the net we've specced is about uh, an eight inch mesh. So fish can come and go through it. Now you have to clean the nets all the time. Through the aquaculture industry, we found mechanical ways that we can clean the nets. In Iceland, we had divers who would go out and scrub the nets all the time, to keep them clean. Much the way you clean the bottom of a boat. It gets algae, it gets growth. So all of that has to be done and the nets have to be cleaned all the time. So in addition to your animal husbandry staff and your veterinarians, you have a marine operations team that takes care of the nets, repairs them, does whatever. Now, seals, seals will come and they'll come right over. They'll jump, they'll come, they'll crawl just as they do right over that net enclosure. Uh, and they can interact with the whales. Uh, there's no sense that they would be uh, prey for one another or anything like that from all that we know. But generally, the seals will choose, well, maybe we won't hang out with the whales as much <laughs> as we might. But it's an environment that you want critters on the bottom, flatfish, crabs. You want the whales to be able to be enriched by that environment. Birds that are coming across the surface, they'll chase the birds. Cake will love to chase the birds across the bay. Hmm. These whales will do the same. So you want it to be that natural environment. You want to create the netting so that critters can come and go. Uh, and that's all part of why you're choosing a given environment as we have chosen Port Hilford Bay, because it's an enriching environment for the whales. So with the we'll, net be, we'll be building a veterinary area, mm -hmm. an animal husbandry building, a administration and a care staff. We'll have a net loft. We'll have an observation tower. We'll build some areas where uh, the public in a very restricted way can do nature walks and be able to observe the whales. On the far coast, on the other side, we'll have big, big eye binoculars and the like so people can see what, what's going on. And we'll have above water and underwater cameras. My dream is that we'll be able to beam live, just as you and I are here live today, beam stories from underwater and above mm. back to the marine park. So the amphitheaters now where a whale might be doing a trick, there'll be a widescreen, uh, a widescreen, uh, uh, widescreen presentation live from the sanctuary so mm. that the trainers who have worked with these animals all these years in captivity might be talking about these whales back to the marine parks where they're no longer in concrete tanks. Beautiful, beautiful vision. So what's a realistic time frame to have this complete and have actual whales in the sanctuary? Well, this is this is a major endeavor. I mean, you know, we're talking uh, probably a $15 million budget to build all of this and then a $2 million a year operating cost to $2.5 million a year. And our goal is to have the first whales in our sanctuary in Port Hilford Bay by the end of 2022. Now that's right around the corner. So it's a stretch goal. But if you don't have stretch goals, nothing gets done. So that may be a little, a little too aggressive, a little too optimistic, but we're looking to that goal. 
We're raising money today to do it. We have some major sponsors. Our lead sponsor from the very beginning of this project has been Munchkin, the baby products company in Los Angeles. Uh, we've had some major foundations that are helping us. We have thousands of uh, people following us on whalesanctuary.org, whalesanctuary.org. And I hope people will, first of all, share the story. That's the most important thing. Reach out on social media. We have over 30, 40,000 people that follow us on social media. That's the first thing. Get the word out. But realistically, support us. Join us in this, in this philanthropic effort to really help these whales around the world. And it's not about the, the whales that will be in our sanctuary. It's about changing the way we, as human beings, relate to whales and dolphins in captivity. There are sanctuaries for elephants, for big cats, and for you know gorillas and chimpanzees now. Elephants are no longer performing in circuses. Right. Now is the time to do the very same thing for whales and dolphins. I couldn't agree more, as you know. So <laughs> the short-term stretch goal would be the end of next year, 2022. What's the long-term goal of the Whale Sanctuary Project? And more importantly, when can I come and visit? <laughs> Well, you can come and visit any time right now. As soon as the border opens, let's go, and I'll yep. show you this site. You have two bedrooms uh, in that? You said you have a, a residence there. Is there two bedrooms? <laughs> oh, yeah. we got room. We'll find a place for you. Thank but you. Uh, the, the, the long-term goal is certainly that this is a model and that everything we do, when we build that veterinary hall, the building, we're not building it solely for our site. We're building it so it can be replicated somewhere else. That's part of our architectural design, that we do things that are that can be copied and that this is a model for other people to do elsewhere. And I'm pleased to say that, you know, right now the country of France has been talking about that they no longer think it's appropriate from a governmental level for four orcas to be in Marineland Antibes. The people in France at One Voice France, one of the nonprofit organizations, they've asked for our help. How do we do this? How can we help them figure out what to do in Europe? There's a whale in Miami Seaquarium who's been there for 50 years. Lolita is what she's been called. The Lummi Nation, the first nation group where she was captured in Washington State, she's been talked about as Tokatai. They've now named her Skelly Shaktana, which is a lummy term for the, the whales that live in the Pacific Northwest. Mm. These are the southern resident orcas that are well known. They've been studied for more than 50 years. She was captured in 1970 in Penn Cove, and they want to bring her home. Mm. We've created the operational plan for the First Nation Lummi to do that. So if they're able to bring their ancestor, because they believe the whales are their ancestors, if they believe the whales that they're, they're ancestors that live under the sea, they'd like to bring her home. And we're partnering with them as well to create the operational plan so they have the capacity to execute on that plan. So we're working with teams everywhere around the world to do this. And that's really what our long-term mission is, not about one, one sanctuary, but about helping how we as humans relate to whales and dolphins in captivity and change their lives. We owe it to them. We have the capacity to do it. We know it's scientifically right to do it. And now we have the will. So if enough people join with us, we can do this everywhere. Not only the will and the desire, but you're creating the model that others can follow around the world. So speaking of internationally, um, I love that you, uh, the Lolita story is a beautiful one, what you just shared. Uh, let's talk about Russia, though. Um, I had a really cool thing happen back in 2019 here in Orange County. I met with Joe R. Heston, who was the Norwegian fisherman who gained international notoriety after uh, releasing Valdemir, the Russian spy beluga whale, from his harness. 
I know that you and Jean-Michel have been working directly with the Russian government and Russian activist groups to release 97 captive orcas and belugas back into the ocean, which would be the biggest whale rescue in history. How did all of that unfold? Well, I think the way that unfolded was that first, the Russian nonprofit organizations and whale enthusiasts, whale activists learned that there had been an illegal capture of initially 100 whales, 87, uh, 87 belugas and 13 orcas. Two of the orcas died. And so there were 11 orcas and then 10 orcas and 87 belugas. And we heard about this uh, from the Russian activists and they asked for our assistance. So we, Jean-Michel Cousteau, myself, and uh, two others, wrote to President Putin and asked if we could assist. Could, they, could our assistance be helpful in any way? And over a long story short, we heard back from uh, actually the governor of the province where the whales were in far eastern end of Russia, near Vladivostok, and he, in the media, said, come on, help us. So we responded back in the media and said we would. Oh. And, you know, we were able to get visas. We took an international team, Russians, one a scientist from New Zealand, Ingrid Visser, others from the States, put together a team of people with veterinarians who could advise the Russians on the health of the animals in evaluating whether they were healthy enough to be returned. And we went to what was euphemistically called the whale jail, where they were being held in these very small net enclosures. They'd been there for nine months at that point through the winter, and they were suffering from some of the cold and they had some, some rashes and the like. But we evaluated the whales and determined from a medical standpoint that they were all healthy enough to be returned. And then Jean-Michel and I were able to meet with the governor privately, draft a resolution for their release, present that to the Minister of the Environment, who we've met with twice in Moscow. It was in turn presented to the Vice Premier and the, and the President, President Putin, and they determined that the whales should be released. And they made the commitment to us that Jean-Michel and I were privileged to sign that proclamation with the governor and present it to uh, the upper echelons of government. And they followed through on that commitment and then over time released all of those whales back, some of them to the waters where they were captured, a thousand miles to the north, others in the waters nearby, but all of them were released back into the wild. And it was certainly we were somewhat instrumental but the credit goes to the activists in Russia who kept that story alive, who made sure that the government was hearing daily about it and that our proclamation didn't quietly disappear. So, yes, our team was instrumental in doing it. We were privileged to be there. But the credit goes to the Russian activists who made it happen and to the government who agreed to do it and today, again, has committed to not keeping whales and dolphins in captivity. And we need to keep the pressure on there because where is the pressure coming from? It's coming from China. China is building marine parks today and they are the market for buying whales that are captured, whales and dolphins. So again, our little short film, Whales Without Walls, a five minute film that has won awards all over the country, all over in Canada, the best short film in the Toronto Film Festival last year. That short film has now been shown in China. It's translated mm -hmm. into China, translated into Russian, translated into Spanish, French, and Italian. A little tiny five-minute film that is being heard everywhere. And with films like that, with the work that you're doing, Rich, and others are doing, we educate people in China to also stop supporting marine parks there. Mm. I, the Russian story is is amazing. I mean, didn't at the end was it was Putin himself that announced 
Didn't he announce yeah. that the wells were going to be released? I, I think he announced it in his five. He does a five hour live broadcast to the Russian people every June. In the course of that broadcast, he and the vice premier announced that they would start releasing the whales and they did the next morning. And they did it. How did that feel for you? I mean, I, I love how it must Wonderful. have. I, I, I just I love your lack of ego in all this, like everything that you shared. It's all about a collaborative spirit. And it, it's really going to take that. I think it for is. It's it's it's, you know, you point fingers. If you point a finger at one person like a marine park, there are always three fingers pointing back at you. That's right. And that's what I learned from Jean-Michel Cousteau, who's my closest friend. We've worked together for 40, 45 years now. And uh, whatever he's doing, I'm happy to support him. Whatever I'm doing, he's happy to support me. Uh, but it's, you know, how many people get to do what we get to do? It's a, it's a tremendous privilege to be able to work with animals, to be able to work with whales, to work with people who share a commitment and a vision for a different future for these animals. So, uh, look, I'm a lucky guy. I've, I've had tremendous experiences all over the world. I've gotten to travel. Uh, and uh, every day that I get to keep doing, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm with you, man. In fact, this has been the luckiest week for me. I, I've signed three books this week, three copies of my Blue Laguna book, book. One went to this guy named Charles Vinnick. You might know him. The second one went to Jean-Michel Cousteau. And the third book, you mentioned her name earlier, went to Sylvia Earle. I got a, a personal email from Sylvia like two days ago, and I signed that book and... No offense to you, but that, that I was even happier about that book than, than the one I sent to you. <laughs> well, you know, her, her, Sylvia is known as her deepness. Her deepness. Yeah. So um, Sylvia is a, just a, 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 a remarkable scientist, a wonderful communicator, and, yeah. and a woman who has uh, done, done more for the marine environment than, than many, many people. Many, many. And I, and for you even to mention the work that I'm doing, I, I, it pales in comparison, but I, I, I can relate to the gratitude because every day I'm like, this is what I'm doing right now is my work. Are you kidding me? Like, it's I, I feel extremely lucky like you. So thank you for, yeah. for saying well, you that. Know, it's, it's the work we get to do. You get up in the morning, you feel great about it. Uh, and it's fun. And, you know, having fun doing what is your life's work is very special. Not not many people get to do that. So we are truly privileged to be able to do what we all are, are doing. It's a gift. I agree 100%. So I want to talk about the future for captive whales and dolphins. You mentioned China. I remember, uh, I can't remember what year it was. The, the year Racing Extinction came out, there was an event at the Ocean Institute in Dana Point, just south of yeah. here. And Luis Ahoyas was there with his team. Yeah. and I got to meet him. And I also met... Um, Christopher Porter, who was a he was in the movie Blackfish and he was a trainer for for Tilikum. Yes. And I remember him saying like people were like at that time, the sea worlds of the U.S. were starting to stop orca shows and whatnot. And everybody celebrated that at this big win. And he, he literally kind of pulled me aside at, at this event when I met him. And he's like, he's like, it's not really a win. Because they're just going to go China, India, other countries. They're just going to take these whales and they're going to continue to show them off and make a profit and all this. So it was a little discouraging. And I'm, I'm glad to talk to you about it because you have an extremely optimistic tone. So <laughs> in your mind, what's the future for captive whales and dolphins? Well, I get my optimism from watching young people. When you when when kids see whales, when they meet whales, instinctively they know how we should treat them. And it also kids. I mean, it's no different when kids meet each other. When they first meet each other, there's no concerns about race or religion or other things. They meet a kid and it's fun, and they interact. They learn their biases from us. They learn their fear from our fears. So when we put our hope in children and we allow them, enable them to see whales and dolphins in sanctuary, in a natural environment, take them whale watching, 
Yeah, even with whale watching, we're sometimes getting too close. We're doing too much of it. We have to be respectful. We get respectful by understanding the science, like Lori Marino's work with the brains of whales. What we learn when we study the brains of whales is that the areas of the brain that impact and allow communication, that, sh that deal with and control our emotions, in the brains of whales, particularly orcas, those areas of the brain are mark more convoluted. They have more of the synapses than do we. So as we learn about them and we watch them, we see their culture. We see a mother whale taking her baby whale with her and training it. When she loses a baby, she mourns the baby in ways that replicate us. When, when mother whales and sisters are separated, when a baby whale is captured, we hear their sounds and it sounds like the keening of a human mother being separated from her baby. So as we are able to communicate the science, communicate the culture that these animals have, and we're able to allow kids to experience them in nature, they will treat them the way we are learning to, but they'll do it naturally. So that's what gives me my optimism. Um, now, yeah, we, we, you know, it's difficult. You know, we got to raise lots of money philanthropically. We're committed to not doing it with government funds because there aren't enough government funds to go around. What we've learned in this last year of, of the pandemic, we've seen how the human capacity to reach out to our fellow humans and help them is there. Yeah. Nonprofit organizations have had to change their direction, have had to help health care, help common uh, areas around justice and other things like that. So we have public health in a way we need it. All of these causes are important. There are no bad causes. What gives me optimism is how many people there are to help all of these causes. For some people, it's the whales. And I, you know, I welcome them with open arms. I'm any day of the week, I'll go anywhere on the planet <laughs> to talk to someone who will help us in this project. Yes. Uh, and I've been privileged to go all over the planet in many ways. So I'm, I'm ready in the morning to go anywhere. But similarly, I'm just awed by how people with means and those with less means help every one of these projects, no matter where they are. So that's what gives me optimism. It's what allows me to jump up out of bed every morning and do this work because I, I love doing it and because it's a, it's a rare privilege to be able to. It is. You know, I'm, I'm curious about you and what led you to do this work. What prompted you to dedicate your life to this work? I, I shared how my first orca encounter, I think I've had eight total, but my first one was that turning point moment for me. Was there an epiphany moment for you? Well, there have, there have been a few. I mean, one of them that, that I do uh, recall vividly, of course, was when uh, I was with the Cousteau team and we were doing filming in Australia. And my role was to go out ahead of the team and try to organize what would happen when the ships came and find the funding for our work and so forth. And I was invited uh, because I was the Cousteau guy uh, into a uh, marine park on the Gold Coast in, in Australia. And the guys, the trainers invited me into the tank and there were some pseudo orcas there, the southern orcas, southern hemisphere orcas. And they showed me the signal and you put your feet together like this and they blow a whistle and the whales come up and throw me up into the air. And oh, that was cool. Wow. <laughs> and then they showed me, OK, you hop on their backs and you water ski across the pool, just uh, riding two whales, one your foot on on the backs of each of two whales. And I got to say, wow, this is about 40 years ago. This was fun. Oh, this is interesting. I never got to do that before. <laughs> But then I was I was time for the show and I was sitting up in the stands with the rest of the visitors. And it struck me that, you know, wait a minute, what had I just done? I'm I'm the Cousteau guy. I'm representing Jacques Cousteau here, the foremost at that time, the foremost ecologist in the world, coined the term in many respects. 
brought it to the public. And it struck me that this was just all wrong. What I just done just didn't make any sense. And that stayed with me a long time. And then you know, certainly, I mean, we would be often asked to be at aquariums and be in marine parks. It just, you know, when we're doing the kind of filming and, and the messaging we're doing, it, it didn't fit. It was, it just didn't connect. Mm. And then having the opportunity to spend the kind of time I did with, with Keiko in Iceland and with a team of people so dedicated to figuring out day to day whether it's possible to help him join a family. Uh, that more than anything impacted this. Uh, and then, you know, my skills are, are bringing people together and helping yeah. people do the work they do and facilitating how this all happens. So being able to bring my skills and my experience to people who are scientists and work with whales and researchers and Together, we collectively create everything that's needed to be able to take steps to do this kind of work. Uh, that gives me uh, a lot of satisfaction and uh, help. Hopefully, I bring something to the party each day. I think you do. If if anything, great energy and love, which is so important. Um, so those two epiphany stories both involved the Cousteaus. I'm curious, how did you connect with them in the first place? <laughs> Interesting story. People how always ask. Just hanging out with you know, Cousteau. You know, how, how how so I was hanging out with Jacques Cousteau one day. and uh, <laughs> how, how do you get that job? I, we yeah. were always asked that question. Uh, it, it, I never trained for any of this. Uh, I, I do have a lot of educational experience, but I was the director of uh, adult and continuing education at uh, the University of Southern California, USC. I was on the faculty there when I was working on my doctorate at the time. And... Uh, and Jean-Michel Cousteau came into my office one day uh, with a, a colleague of his, a colleague who is, we've worked with all these years, Richard Murphy, and they were looking for a university who could help provide uh, educational uh, underpinning for some of their field work. Hmm. And so the way I tell the story is I had an office up on the second floor and a number of people working on my team. And Jean-Michel Cousteau and I were in my office meeting along with Murphy, Dick Murphy. And uh, all the women in my office were leaning up against the door like this, <laughs> listing in. And if I opened the door, they would have all fallen in. And had I not agreed that we should join forces with, with Jean-Michel and the Cousteau Society in uh, providing some educational uh, experience and some marketing and uh, kind of packaging their field work, their field courses, uh, they would have thrown me out the second story window. So I agreed to do that. And long story short, John Michelle and I became close friends. I was introduced to his father uh, and uh, worked with them for, for many, many years. And when the opportunity arose and they asked if I would join their team from the university, I uh, said yes and so, uh, spent the next probably 30, 35 years doing that kind of work with them in many different capacities. That's amazing. So you're saying when you were in your office alone, all the women weren't leaning into your door? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Jean-Michel's pretty, you know, he's a star of stage and screen in many respects, as well as uh -huh. being a, an educator and, and a researcher uh, and a filmmaker. Uh, so they were certainly interested in what was happening on my side of the door. I bet. So his late great father famously said, we protect what we love. Jean-Michel followed in his footsteps saying, protect the ocean and you protect yourself. As you mentioned earlier, it was back in, I think, 1977 that Jacques Cousteau sounded the alarm to the UN, essentially yes. warning of the damages we were doing and potential consequences. And yet we've continued to use the ocean as an open sewer. Um, what have you witnessed in these, what was it, 40 plus years with the Cousteau family? What have you witnessed in terms of changes to the ocean over that period? Well, I think there is no question that we have changed. Uh, in those days, in 77 and 78, when I was working initially first with them, the air quality over Los Angeles, where we often were, we had an office in Los Angeles, an office in Paris, an office in New York, and in Virginia. Uh, and so we've seen change. 
we have certainly uh, improved in many ways the environment, both in the ocean and elsewhere. But we've also, what, tripled the population of the world in that time or more? Yeah. And so our carrying capacity for the little blue planet that we live on, we call it planet Earth, but it's really planet ocean. And uh, the blue planet that we live on, we've challenged its carrying capacity in these years while our technology has gotten better. We have certainly learned what we need to do. But while we have known about climate change and the impact of climate change on the ocean, we haven't increased the speed with which we are making change to keep pace with the, change, the, the stress that we're putting on it. So certainly we know better, yeah. but we are not making the changes with the speed that we must. And we are not doing it universally across the globe in the way that we must. So people say, well, look, why should we make change if Russia, China, India aren't making change as much as we need to? Well, but stop and think on a per capita basis, we, perhaps the most privileged country in the world, have to do more. We have to be model citizens for them, and we have to use the wealth that we have and help distribute it elsewhere. So, yeah, I've, I've seen change. I continue to be optimistic, but I'm also realistic. And if we're realistic, we have to be more committed. So we can't all work in every arena. The arena I'm working in is with the whales. Yeah. But at the same time, we have to make it a sustainable environment for them and a sustainable environment for us. And we're not doing enough today across the board for, for that to happen. And if we don't, our children and our grandchildren must hold us accountable for that. Because we are, you and me, and I'm older than you, but we are, we're the first generation that isn't giving our children a better environment than our parents gave to us. And so we have a, a, a tremendous responsibility not to let that happen. I agree. And I like how you mentioned that you, you not that you don't care about all these issues, but you stay in your, your lane, which is regarding the whales. And for me, I'm someone who cares about the overall welfare of the planet and and the humans, but honestly, the real reason that I do what I do is for the dolphins and whales. And I sense that you're really somewhat similar in that way. Obviously, you care about the whole equation. Why is it so important to you that we protect these sacred animals? Because protecting them is protecting ourselves. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, I mean, nature is going to go on. No matter what we do, nature will continue. We are but a blip on the, the time scale of Earth's creation and its evolution. But we have the capacity to help ourselves, but everything is connected. If you look at the oceans, what happens to the ocean impacts us every way, every day. How the health of these whales. Some just a little tiny story. We were doing a film with, with Cousteau and part of it was about whales and it was about the marine environment. And so we were taking studies of what is the, some of the chemical carrying that, that we are carrying. And so, you know, you do blood tests of adults and you find that they have some of these chemicals that have come to us from flame retardants, particularly in California, you're required to have all this flame retardant chemicals in <clears throat> carpets and bedding and the like in pajamas. We took some blood tests of a young child, a son of one of the Cousteau research scientists, and his levels of these chemicals 
were huge because he's been on the carpet in pajamas and the like for all these years that the chemicals have been required. We took blood from orcas in the Pacific Northwest and found the same chemicals in them. Why? Because as you've said it, everything we do, we take a pill, we flush that toilet, it goes out in one way or another yeah. into the ocean. So by protecting these whales, it's only a story of protecting the connected environment that we all live in. And what we do for them, we are truly doing for ourselves in every way. Because we cannot live in an environment without all of this animal kingdom that we have with us, without that marine environment. So if we don't protect it, we're not protecting ourselves. Hmm. Beautifully said. One of the most common questions I get is, do I communicate with the dolphins and whales? And I'm curious, how deep is it for you, Charles? Do you feel the whales hold ancient wisdom? Do you communicate with them? Or is it more just an energetic connection? What is it? Well, I think when you're in close proximity to a whale, and maybe to any animal, but particularly in, in the discussion we're having with a whale, Every diver that's put their eye next to the aisle, eye of a whale, and you see it in every film. I mean, everyone wants to end their film <laughs> that way. But there's a reason why they do, because that's such an emotional connection when it happens, and it doesn't happen for everyone. But you've had the opportunity, I've had opportunities where you're in that presence. You feel something. We were when we were in Russia, we talked earlier about being in Russia. One of the women on our team was pregnant at the time. And she got close to a beluga. And the beluga would not leave her alone. Just kept coming up toward her and the baby she was carrying. Now you can explain it away all you want. But there was something going on. There was a connection happening. So what's communication? Well, we're not sharing words. We're not. Will we ever share words? I don't know. There are certainly experiments that have gone on. But there is no question that emotional connection happens. There are way too many stories to discount that. And why would we not think so? You know, why would we be so skeptical of the fact that emotion, heartfelt connection exists? And so uh, I think it's real, but it's less important to me than our respecting the connection that they have among themselves and mm -hmm. our allowing that to live as it should, rather than trying to connect it to us in some way. <laughs> you know, in some ways, that doesn't matter. What matters is, hey, let's learn how to live among our own species respectfully and respect all the rest, and not do anything to harm it, just as we shouldn't be doing all that we do to harm ourselves. I love that you said that. When, as soon as you mentioned that the moment of staring a whale, a wild whale eye to eye, it brought me to the one time I've been to the Silver Bank in the Dominican Republic. Have you, have you swam with the humpbacks there? I have not. I know of it. I have not. I've not swam with the humpbacks there. I, I highly recommend it. I mean, I've had 2000 dolphin and whale encounters, as you've seen with almost every species you can imagine right here off the coast of Laguna. But it was this one moment on the final dive at the Silver Bank. 
baby humpback whale comes right up and I'm just eye to <laughs> eye with this whale. I get back on the boat and I literally cry my eyes out for five straight hours that night. Yeah. I couldn't speak. Yeah. And I can't even, I'm like, I'll go there right now if I <clears throat> let myself, but it's like, was there a community, like you said, was there a communication? I don't know. I, I can't explain it, but there was just something about it. And it's those moments where you're just like, I just, I need to commit the rest of my life to protecting them. And it's to your point, it's not about us and, oh, we can have these interactions with them. No, <laughs> it's about doing the right thing, right, for them. And so keeping them with their families, like, like you and I know, like these orcas, to me, they're, they're take an orca and pull it out of the ocean and put it into a tiny little pool for our entertainment is no different than if I broke into your home and just grabbed your child out of its bed. That's and just, exactly right. That's right. Absolutely the same thing. So I just, I appreciate you, Charles. I, I'm just absolutely loving this conversation. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll share links to everything that you've talked about to Whale Sanctuary Project and, and the video that you mentioned. The um, What is it called? Walls? Whales Without Whales Walls. Without Walls, which I've watched. It's beautiful. We'll share links to everything. Uh, just final question, and, and you said this already, like like a lot of people and yourself, I consider myself an optimist about the future, but also a realist. So is there something that you want to share, perhaps a message of hope that your efforts, people's individual efforts and our collective efforts are truly making a positive impact on the planet, the ocean and its creatures? Well, I, I think, you know, what what's important is that we all interact with our environment, whatever that environment is, differently. But what's most important is that we all need to sustain ourselves. And in doing that, the only way to do it is to protect that environment, to protect it. So, uh, those of us who have the opportunity and love whales, let's get out there with the whales. You know, those who have other experiences, do the same. Do it with the same joy mm -hmm. and, you know, and the same love. Because these are the emotions that we've seen with the whales. We've seen those emotions as they interact with one another. And what I hope for everyone uh, particularly in a year that's been so tough for so many, is that we'll find that reaching out and opening our hearts and opening our arms to others is what is sustainable and what brings sustainability for all of us and for the critters we love. Man, I love this conversation. Charles, it's such an mm -hmm. honor. I'm just loving this. I hope this is just the beginning. I, I'm, I'm going to hold the vision by the end of next year that I can be there with you in Nova Scotia and uh, experience the Whale Sanctuary Project. I would That would make me very happy, and I'm, I'm sure I have many people in my world that would love to tag along. So thank you for your heart, for your love, for your energy. Uh, what's the best way, last question real quick, what's the best way for people to support the Whale Sanctuary Project and your work in general? Well, the best way certainly is uh, certainly learn what we're doing. Whalesanctuary.org or whalesanctuaryproject.org. Both get to the same place. Uh, and share what we're talking about. Share the vision and the like with others. That's the most important thing, because this is not about one activity. It's about changing how we relate to whales and dolphins and to captive animals give them the dignity and the, hum the humanity. They are sentient beings uh, that they deserve. And those that can truly join with us financially and otherwise, because this is something that's tremendously important. We can't do it alone. Uh, and we welcome everybody to join with us in every way that uh, they can. And I look forward to having the chance to speak with you again, Rich. I hope we'll do this more. Uh, and again, I commend you for everything that you're doing and for the work that you, that you do. Uh, it's a real pleasure to meet you and to speak with you. Charles, thank you. If I can do anything to support you, please let me know. That's our thanks show, so everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much, Charles. Bye, everybody.